Hello! How y'all doing? i just got 20, 27 in at the moment. Oh, is that coming through? Are we on? Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Oh, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't see it on the monitor then. So, can you hear everything? Can you hear everything okay there? Six in, yeah. Sorry, I didn't give her uh, a, a, a bit more notice for the actual uh, live hang. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to get it, uh, uh, if it was, uh, if it was going to happen, but uh, it did. And so I, di I didn't give the email out. I didn't send out the email yesterday. I just sent it out today. So um, I'll, I'll just chat with a few of you for a while before we, uh, until we've got a few more people in. But um, yeah, the. Uh, Today in the uh, seminar, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the minor pentatonic scale. So um, today, this is the last of the 10th anniversary live hangs. So it's obviously uh, the 10th anniversary. Um, I put out that video yesterday, giving a little bit of a, I suppose it's a bit of a speech, just um, thanking everybody uh, for all the support over the uh, over the years. And... Um, yeah, so I uh, I thought I'll you know over this over this past month I've I've done a bunch of live hangs. Uh, if you've not seen all of them, uh, I've done ones on oh, loads of stuff, chord tones, scales, improvisation, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they're all there at the channel, so you can just you know browse through it all. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is going to be the last one of them uh, for now. So I'll pro I'll probably still do one like once a week you know next week um but uh, in terms of having multiple ones per week i'm not going to be doing as many of those or not doing any of those um so yeah i wanted to finish with one that's just a little bit of fun um rather than being all like theory based or you know the other stuff that we've done technique based this one's just about the minor pentatonic scale the the scale that you know everybody uses in rock um, you know, any time that you want to hear any kind of, you know, any time you hear any kind of fill, it's always going to be something along the lines of, you know, it's going to be these, these notes, usually on E. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'll just go over some stuff um, on that. For those of you that have never actually tried you know, using a minor pentatonic scale. Like, the minor pentatonic scale is the thing that you will hear Geezer Butler using in uh, in Black Sabbath all the time. Um, yeah, just everything. Yeah, you know, the, it has a particular sound. That kind of... Yeah, they um, start on the open E there. Oops. I've got this Ibanez again. It always slips off on that top. You know, it's, it, it's that sound. And... Um, you might know it also as the kind of blues scale sound because you get the blues, you know, got that blues note in there. That's just that's just a, a flat five or a sharp eleven that you you put there with it into the minor pentatonic to get a little bit of that bluesy sound. Um, but um, yeah, we'll talk about that quite a bit today. Uh, I'll give you some tips on moving around the neck with it and a few things that you can do and a few things that you can actually do to make it a little bit less pentatonic -y. Um if you know if you're trying to get a few uh, different notes in there or different ways of actually playing the notes in there you know using different intervals just to get a little bit of a different sound so I'll cover a little bit of that as well um, so who we got in uh, we've got Walter there hi Walter all the old uh, favorites in hi Diego Ron hi Pascal Nick, Pedro, Poland, Spain, Argentina. Oh, we've got someone from England. <laughs> from Newcastle. Newcastle. Can you make a video on your audio setup? How to record bass properly? Well, to be honest, 
um, well, for, for doing the videos, uh, for doing the, the uh, you know, the talking based videos, I just go direct into a desk. So I go, well, I say it's a desk, it's a Zoom, um, what is it, BR16 or whatever you, I can't remember the name of it now. It's a 16 track uh, mixer. And so I just go straight into a, into a DI box and then split it so that it just goes to a, just to an amp. Um, but I don't mic it up, so that's just for monitoring. But I just basically, the recording is just the direct signal. Um, I do have a pedal board set up in case I need to do anything a little bit different. Um, looping or, you know, chorus, or any of that stuff. Then when I've recorded it, so I record the video and I record the audio separate. And then in Premiere, I dub the audio onto the video separately. And I'll generally reamp it in there. So I'll usually use a B15 or an M SVT um, amp sim if, uh, you know, depending on the sound I'm going for. Uh, I might add, uh, I've actually got dark glass um, plug-in as well that's, that's pretty good. So that uh, I can get that more modern kind of, you know, modern metal kind of sound with it. But um, yeah, that's all it is. It's just I'm direct, just direct into the desk. And then all, all the rest of it's done in uh, Premiere. So there's no fancy kind of setup at all. And here I'm just going directly into, well, I'm actually going through a, a Zoom B3 uh, just so that I can actually, uh, I'm using a B15 amp sim in there just to give it a bit of warmth. Because if you go into direct in while you're doing live streaming, like if I take that out, let me take out the amp. Yeah, it has that. It has that really ticky. You know, it has that kind of sound. But if I put the amp sim in, it's got a, a, a just a different kind of sound. And I've got the reverb there if I need it. Uh, you know, it's got that whole. that and then what have I got here? I have actually got a, a compressor if I need it but it's really just the B15 uh, that I've got working there uh, and that's going into a Yamaha what is it AG05 or whatever it's called I can't remember the name of it now <laughs> it's just a USB mixer just going direct in and I'm using XSplit for as my uh, uh, for the as the streaming uh, platform going then into YouTube, obviously. But mm, apart from that, it's, it's pretty direct. I mean, the amp sims are the way to get around that horrible direct sound. But I try not to get too... I don't, I don't crank the bass and stuff. I basically use them flat. And then uh, just, just to give it... A, uh, I might drop the treble off a little bit. Because like I said, when you've got it... Which is all right for... You know, it's alright for that, I suppose. It's, it just sounds a bit ticky, ticky, ticky. So. So, you've just got... I, I, I take the treble. It's just, it's just got a nicer tone, really. Even if it's just flat. Thanks, Don. Yeah, my speech about the 10th anniversary. And if you've not seen it yet, I've done the post over at uh, the website. It's the History of Talking Bass. There's a picture of me doing my very first gig there, which I didn't even know existed until a few uh, months ago. I met up with a friend of mine who was the guitarist in that band when I very first started. And um, he sent me the pictures and I couldn't believe it. It was for his sister's birthday. Um, we were just a, um, a garage band, basically. We just got together and we just played instrumentally played like Megadeth tunes and Pantera tunes and Queen tunes and we did Orgasmatron by Motorhead. We did a lot of metal stuff, but we also did like a bunch of things like uh, we did Back to Shalabal by Joe Satriani off the Flying in a Blue Dream album. We did, that was one of the first ones he did because he was a pretty good guitarist. And uh, we all just learned pretty quick because we're all pushing each other to learn like more and more um, complicated things. I mean, not that complicated, is it, learning Megadeth tunes? But it's, you know, for a beginner, it is. Um, it's not like we were playing Chick Corea tunes, but it was, uh, yeah, it was really good. And so, you know, we were playing for about, what, six months to a year? And then uh, it was her birthday, and so we, we played for all the kids in the, in the, in the village. 
And um, yeah, it was uh, that was the only gig I've ever been nervous on. I remember being nervous before I did it. Uh, and after that, I never had uh, stage fright again. It was, <laughs> But I do remember thinking, oh man, this is the first time I've ever played bass in front of people. Um, but yeah, that was that, uh, you know, I'm wearing the Nirvana t-shirt and then an extreme cap. It's like a complete contrast there. And um, yeah, so and I, and I was just growing my hair long. So I'd got that thing where it just sort of comes out at the sides there. I mean, I ended up growing it right down here. It was crazy hair that I had for a, quite a while. And then uh, and then I went to a skinhead for uh, a few years. As I've said before, uh, I, you know, people have asked me about when me and Scott Divine first got to meet each other at college. And he had hair. He had like um, curtain haircut. And uh, fairly longish hair, and I had a skinhead, so we'd uh, completely we're, we're the complete opposite now. Louisiana, hi Martin. Alan's bass covers here from Peterborough. Hi Gary, from Pittsburgh. Yeah, we've got ooh, we've got um, Michael's in from uh, India. Got a good spread of people here. How do you clean your fretboard, Mark? I don't. <laughs> I hardly ever do. You can see this thing's a mess, and I don't even play it very often. So, no, I don't really... I don't look after my basses particularly well, to be honest. I never did. Um, when I was playing a lot, um, when I was, you know, uh, gigging professionally, I just... I was so bad, uh, you know... I barely changed my strings, to be honest. Um, I just never got time to do it. I just couldn't be bothered. It was just turn up, play. It was. It, there would, it's just a tool to me, to be honest. I don't really have any... I don't have that thing that people have got with basses where they're like, oh, they're really precious about them. I, I would if I had a really expensive bass. You know, like a... Um, you know, like a Ritter or something like that. One of these things that looks like it should be in a... A, a museum or a you know that's uh, or on a wall you know it looks like something that you you know that you'd find um you know it looks like they've been sculpted out of marble but um i don't so you know having a fender jazz and a fender precision and, and even this ibanez i mean this thing's battered you can see all this look at it it's it's battered um and th and i actually looked after this one a little bit but you can see uh, on the back it's scratched to hell and it's um you know the end there see it's all battered um so i i don't really look after them that well i should but i don't um <laughs> i'm terrible did you boil your strings i used to do when i was a broke student i used to uh because i'd buy like one packer every two years or something and uh you know they're expensive aren't they bass strings and, um, you know, I can't be changing those every gig or every... I mean, people like Yannick Wistalo, he changes them, like, every day or something. I mean, he certainly does them every gig. Um, but I don't. I just... Uh, I, so what I used to do is I used to boil them. Yeah, I used to... And it does work to some extent. Um, not... I mean, they never sound new. But when they, they start to lose that zing, I'd boil them. Or even not that zing, because I'm not too fussed about that new zing. But um, you know, if they got really dead, then I'd uh, then I'd, I'd boil them. And uh, I mean, some people say that doesn't work, but it does. It does. It just it just doesn't. You don't. They're not like new. You know. Um. Okay. So, God, Oceanside, uh, Ocean. <laughs> I misread that then. Just based with the Oceanside, California. I, I thought it said Ocean Size, which is a band. Um, that a really good mate of mine was in. In fact, a lot of the guys from that, <laughs> we all went to college together. Um, Cool. Okay. So, uh, we've got 112, and I'll start talking about uh, minor pentatonic scales. So, minor pentatonic scale, what is it? What's a minor pentatonic? So, I mean, it's basically, if you, let's say we take a, a natural minor scale, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to do all this in E, you know. Like I said, we're going to have fun today. I'm not, I'm not going to, get to, you know, I'm not going to, every key and all this kind of stuff. We're just going to see, I'm going to give you something that you can use in the majority of rock tunes because they're all in E. So E minor, anyway. So um, if we take an E natural minor scale. Am I, no, I'm on an E flat. Well done. Okay. 
yeah? So that's going to be E, F sharp, G, and then you're going to have A, B, C, and then D, E. So that would be the natural minor scale. And all you do to make a, a minor pentatonic is you take out the sixth and the second. So, uh, or second and then sixth if you want to do it in order. Um, so what you get is... So we've got the root note, we've got a minor third, we've got the perfect fourth, we've got the perfect fifth, we've got the minor seventh, and we've got the octave. And it gives you that sound. So it's... Um, I'll just give you the frets just in case you don't know what that is. Uh, and this is starting on the first finger, and that's... good. Pay attention to that, because that's actually going to uh, come in later on as we start looking at other um, positions. But um, uh, let's say on E there at the 7th fret of the A string, you're going to have the E there at the 7th fret. Then you've got the G at the 10th fret, so they're on the A string. Then uh, you've got the uh, A and B there at the uh, what's that, 7th and 9th frets. And then the D and the E up at the... Uh, 7th and ninth frets of the G string. I'm terrible with frets. I only use the C notes. So that's the uh, that's the notes of the um, of the E minor pentatonic scale. And no matter where you play that set of notes, it's still going to be that E minor pentatonic scale. So don't get too caught up in thinking of a box pattern that looks like that, because if you just look at a single octave box of that then you're going to get stuck in that box. Now, it's okay for a, uh, for a while, because, you, you know, you can... You know, you can mech up little bass lines. You know, you've got that kind of thing. But um, you really want to spread out from that, especially if you want to start playing fills that... If you want to start moving up and down the fretboard a little bit. Now... Let's just think of it in terms of that position, uh, that, that fingering to begin with, okay? So I had the first finger, fourth finger, first finger, third finger, first finger, third finger. Okay, so it's a very simple shape, and that's, that's why people love this scale, because it's, uh, it's, you can use it in loads of different contexts, and it just falls under the fingers so easy. It's so easy to play quick. Um... Two, two notes per string on, with that pattern. Now, obviously, we can play it there, but we could also play it from that open E string, which, if we were to play it down here using the open strings, we're going to have the E, then the G, then the A, then the B, then the D, then the E. So, so all that is, is that pattern transferred down to the open strings. So, so you got open E string, then the G at the third fret, and then it's just open A uh, to the B at the second, uh, yeah, second fret of the A string, open D, second fret of the of the D string. Dead easy. So that's that's two positions. Oops. Two positions using exactly the same finger. I know that, yeah, we're not using the same finger because we're going to use the open strings. But, you know, in terms of the, the pattern, right, we've, we've got that. Where else could we play it? Well, we could play it at the 12th fret of the E string as well, couldn't we? Because that's just that up the octave, starting at the 12th fret. So, same as that. So it's just the same box pattern that we've just moved to these different uh, iterations of E. Where else could we play it? Well, I mean, we could play it up here. If you've got enough frets... It's hard to get your fingers in up there. Just... So you could play it up there, obviously. But also we've got the E at the second fret of the D string. So just think, we can only go up two strings in one position, but... So that just gives us another little bit of an iteration. So we've got that. We've also got it... Oops. Up there as well. So that's just with two strings. So... So already we've got our little map 
and we're just expanding the map. You know, we started in the little, um, you know, our little village or whatever. We or or like I, I've always used this analogy, like a little desert island. You're on the beach. You're just washed up on the beach. You're not like cast away, and you're trying to map out the islands because you want to find some. You you got to find water. You got to find some food. But you know, there's some sound of some. You know, some, I don't know, cannibal tribe over there. You can hear some growling, you know, you can hear a T-Rex over there. We, I think we've ventured into Jurassic Park. So there's some things going over there, but, you know, you've got to be a bit careful. There's snakes, there's all kinds of things, and you're a bit wary about moving out, which is kind of what happens. You you get used to one area, and then it, as soon as you've got to move up a little bit, it's like, hey, we're, we're getting outside of our, uh, our box. So then... Um, you can start to just, you know, map it out and just expand that map. But of course, as you expand this map, you know, as you draw a few more things in, there we go. There's, uh, you know, I've gone past the waterfall. I've got, I found the waterfall. Okay, we found the waterfall. I can go and get some water from there. So you've expanded to there. And then it's like, you'll see that day in, day out as you go to get your water. You become familiar with it. Then expand it a little bit more. You get over there and you find out that tribe's actually a nice tribe. So now you've got that area. You've got a little path going over to it. You think, okay, that's cool. And then over there, the, what you thought was a T-Rex isn't. It's just like... um you know, there's a, uh, I don't know, some kind of uh, water park that's over there that you didn't realize. And, you know, they've just got an imitation T-Rex. And so we know that's okay now. So we've got over there. So we've expanded the map a little bit. Starting there. And we now know that we can come down here. And when we get up to that E, we've got the repeat of that there from that E. Okay, so a little bit more. Not much, but a little bit more. We've still got, like, this mess here between that E and this. And, you know, we've got this here, but we've, we've you know, we've got a, a little bit of a mess here. You know, an uncharted territory there. But we're getting there. So, one thing that people do tend to... Um, advocate when they're teaching pentatonic scales is they talk about the five positions and you know they'll teach you that one and then and just work through them like that but um i tend not to do that because i think when you do that when you're just thinking in terms of like let's say the modes of the minor pentatonic and and you're just seeing these little box shapes you're you the um you have to be careful not to fall into the trap of just seeing a box shape unrelated to, let's say, the harmony or or the root note or whatever. Because if you learn that, that first pattern that we did, and then it's like, oh, if you move down one, you've got this one. You know, oh, okay, that's that's those two frets, those two frets, and those two frets. Okay, well, I've got that. It's, it's like that, and then it goes down here a bit, and then, you know, and you kind of make this visual pattern of it. What that doesn't tell you is where the root note is. You know, if you're playing over an E minor, you know, and you... And then you want to play something over this E minor pentatonic. Yeah, you've got this new pattern that you've got. But you're not thinking in terms of what the harmony is. You're not thinking of where the root note is. You know, all you've got, you're working from the D then. You're working from the flat seven. Now, you might want to do that. That might be fine. But you at least want to know where that root note is. But when you show somebody this and they're a beginner or they're just new to this, they just accept the box pattern and the visual shape for what it is. And they don't think about what the actual, the notes are or what the, the, the chord tones are or, or just how it relates to the music that you're playing it just becomes a you know this, this pattern that you end up playing so i find that it's a lot lot better to actually always have your bearings and know where the root note is and base everything around that so i learn these pentatonic kind of shapes in the same way that I would uh, a major scale, let's say, or a minor scale or anything like that. Um, I don't think modes, I don't think, you know, if I'm working around on it, let's say it's a C major scale. I do not think of modes, you know, E Phrygian. Okay, well, if you're here, you're going to be on E Phrygian and here you're going to be on F Lydian. I don't think of any of that. Um, I always think of C major. So if you're playing up here, I'm always thinking of C, 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 Senora. 
I always know where that C is, I know where the third is, I know where the fifth is, I know what the intervals are. You always want to know what the intervals are around the, the harmony. Uh, and what intervals you're playing within the scale. So, so if you're on an E minor pentatonic, let's say, and you've learned this other pattern like that, you you want to know that that note that was further down, that that's the fifth, and that that's the third, and that's the seventh, and that's the seventh, you know, and that's the fourth. You always want to know what that is. So I like to learn them relative to a particular root note. Okay, so here again, if we're on this. This E here at the seventh fret of the A string. We've got this pattern starting on this first finger, but what you can do as well is start it on the second finger or third finger. I mean, ignore the fingering for now. It's more of a, a, a shape, right? And um, this is the same as when you learn the major scale. You can learn the major scale starting on the second finger, first finger. Oops or uh, starting on the fourth finger. So here we're going to start on the second finger. So second finger for the E, and then we can play the G here. So that's the fifth fret of the D string. So instead of playing it here like this, with the G here at the tenth fret of the A string, we play this G here at the fifth fret of the D string. We can also play the D that's just below the E, because we've got access to these lower frets. So. We're looking at the E though, We're, everything's relative to this E, to the root note. So we've got that, then we can work up through the 4th and 5th again, so that's going to be 5th fret, 7th fret, ninth fret. Don't worry about the stretch, just move the hand if you need to, and I'll show you a way around this in a sec as well. But that's the pattern there, and the E, G, A, B, and then D and E up on the top, which you can play with the 1st and 4th finger or 1st and 3rd finger. The fingering is irrelevant, it's just the actual pattern. So that's the same as that, but now we've also got the D below, okay, so, and every time I play anything like this, if I'll start on the root note, so I've got my bearings, work up, come down, come down to the next note down, and then I always finish back on the root note, so I've again got my bearings. Now, what else can we do with these? Well, the other, the one thing that I've missed out there is that we had, the, for the one that we started on the first finger, well, we can actually drop below that onto the onto the E string, down to the D at the tenth fret of the E string, down to the um, B at the seventh fret of the E string, and back. Okay, so we've now ex extended that pattern so that we're playing on all of the strings there. Instead of just having this, you know, just working around and around that. But now we can actually go down onto the E string. Same thing with this. We've got this pattern, but then we can drop down to the B at the 7th fret on the E string, and the 5th fret for the A. Now, that fingering is a little bit awkward. I, I, I showed you it like that just to highlight that it would be a second finger fingering. But what you would usually do is maybe start with the third finger, use the first finger for the G, then the third finger for the, uh, for the, for the A there, then m slide up or shift up to the next one, and then up to the D. So you're just using the first and third fingers, and this is a very common way of playing around on a on an E minor pentatonic, and then you can play the D with the first finger again, so. And there's a, there's a, I mean, you could also move up with the first finger as well. So when I, when I work up, I generally work up with the third finger. So third finger, first finger, third finger, third finger, first finger, third finger, and then I use the first finger when I'm descending. First finger again for the D, and then third finger, first finger for the uh, notes below. Oops. Like I said, start on the, on the root note, work up. Come back down, all the way down, as far as you can go, and then come back to the E. Okay, 
Okay, so now we've got two, two positions, and we've we've extend we've expanded quite a bit here. Now the other thing that you can do is actually start on the fourth finger. Now what this in essence does is gives us that uh, one of those positions that I was just talking about with the you know with the five positions. Um, so now you could start on the fourth finger for the uh, for the E, work up with the let's say the first and fourth fingers for the G and the A, but then bring the B into play here at the fourth fret of the G string. So we've just added an extra note, but we're still thinking of that E. We're starting on the E, we're coming up, we're coming up as high as the D, back down, and then back down again to the A. So we're only adding one note into the mix there, because this other one actually um, had a, a position shift, you could say. But that gives you quite a bit of real estate to work around. So you've got that one, you can shift down, and remember that's all it takes, you can just move down one note to get to the next one. So it's worth practicing moving between those positions. So if you've got this position, you can just drop down from that A down to that G, and you're there. And you can bring those E string notes into play, but... Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is what uh, arpeggio we've got in there as well. So we've actually got an E minor, pe uh, e minor pentatonic, an E minor arpeggio, an E minor seven arpeggio in there, and that's important to to note because uh, when you're using a minor pentatonic like this, you're really probably going to be working on a, an E minor kind of thing, and that's your framework of the harmony. That's they're the, the they're the go-to notes. But all that we're doing, in essence, on an E minor pentatonic is just adding a fourth into the mix. So an E minor pentatonic is just a minor, uh, a minor seven arpeggio with a fourth as a passing note. But when you're on this fourth finger, you can work up through the arpeggio. So we've got the E, the G, the B, and the D. So that's seventh fret E string. So, so, blah, 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 blah. Seventh fret A string. 5th fret D string, 4th fret on the G string, and the 7th fret on the G string. So there's your minor pentatonic, there's your minor pentatonic, there's your minor pentatonic with the octave on the top. So it's always good to, to know that you're outlining that minor pentatonic. So we've now got a little bit more real estate. Think about that map I was talking about. We're getting it, we're making it a little bit, um, well, we're finding a few more places to uh, explore and uh, hunt for, uh, or, go and, you know, find some, uh, what, what are you going to want out there? Go fishing or, you know, get some coconuts. So see what I can do there? I can come up and down that and drop down, just drop down easily. Okay, and now when you combine that with this open string one, we can now drop down to the G. So remember what we had here? I can play up, come up into this position, come down, and we're on the open string. And I mean, you know. It all sounds pretty bland at the moment. It's all very minor pentatonic -y, you know. But we've we've worked up from here down to here. Okay? And then remember we've now we've also got the first finger one that I talked about. actually move up from that G there we can shift up into this position to bring us up here you could use you can use any one of the strings as a doorway so if we're here and I'm on this G we're in this position I can use the D string as the doorway to come down so 
that's quite a big jump from the G down to the E, so fifth fret down to the second fret on the D string. But that puts us into that area. Uh, you could come down the same down here. just using particular strings as doorways for moving down up and down and you'll find the certain ones that you like and certain ones you don't like like it's a little bit awkward moving down that minor third so you're probably not gonna do that you might do that there with the G oops you know you could use that one now the other thing to bear in mind as well because let's just fill in the gaps a little bit more remember what we said about starting on this uh, second fret of the D string with it we can only add the two strings, but remember, we can, just as we did here, you know, when we played this pattern up here, well, remember what I said, we could come down onto the E string with that minor third pattern below. Well, we can do the same thing here. And that fills in the gaps. You can actually come all the way down. So we've got this second um, fret for the E there. Come down on the D and the B, fifth fret and the second fret on the uh, on the uh, D string, and then A and the G there at the fifth and third frets of the E string, and then we're down again. So so the whole of that area, that position, we're on that. E on the D string. We've got the notes up here, but we can fill it in below. But I would always start on the E and then finish on the E, you know, in terms of practicing it. So work up, come down, come all the way down. So we're thinking more in terms of like complete positions across the strings based on a particular root note so in this case it's the root note the e on the d string uh, the second fret in this one it's the open e string and remember you can also go up to the g and the a up at the top so it's worth filling in all the other strings in any one position So here I'm thinking open E string is my basis for it. Use the open G string and the A just to fill in the gaps. That gives you something to work from. I mean, when you're playing, you know, <laughs> that's those notes there, isn't it? So, but while I'm here and I've got that first finger on the E, yeah, I can extend it even more so. And then we can shift with a single note up into this one around this E, whether it's this one, that one, or this one. So we've got like three position, uh, three fingerings or three um, shapes that are based around this E. We've got a shape that's based around this E, and then we've got one that's based around the open E. So this box pattern, for want of a better term, that's your open E one. Then you've got this one at the E at the second fret of the of the D string, and then you've got this the positions around this E here. And then, once we get up to here, we've actually got this E up at the ninth fret of the G string, so we can extend a little bit more. So if you're playing up here, we can actually work up to there. So, like I say, just expand your map, just one note at a time. I'm not even thinking of all the other notes in that position. I've just come up and thought, oh, I've got the G there as well. Once, once you've got a few a few positions down, just start adding one note at a time. You know, just noodling around, just playing around, just going up and down. So, you know, and then you and then once you get up to here, remember, it's the same as it was down here. So everything that we do up to the open, uh, sorry, up to the twelfth fret, it all just repeats at the twelfth fret. So. And 
then we can move up. So then it's all taking place here with this E. So if you're thinking of this E, you can do all that stuff that we did down here with the three positions. You can do it all from here as well. So look, we've got that position. We can use our little, this one we had here where we, that one. And if you want, you can use the fourth finger uh, to come up. And that's basically what we've got when we come up and we move up to that, up to that G up at the 12th fret. But you'll probably find that one less useful. You'll probably prefer being around here on this E because it's just easier with the fingering. Whereas when you're, you know, when you've got this first and fourth finger thing, when you start dealing with the minor thirds on one string, that's when it starts to, when it's not as comfortable under the fingers, you know. That's really comfortable under the fingers, but the minute that you start having the these minor thirds in there on one string, you start wanting to get back. So, yeah, so that's all of that. Once you've got up here, you, you're safe now on your... Remember, we can... Here we go. So that's the E. It's the same as that one. Remember what I did? Down here, we had this one. It's just a repeat. So, um, yeah, so that's some positions, okay? So that's, I mean, I mean, I know that's quite a bit of information to, um, to, to just bombard you with. But um, if, you, if you go about it, just, especially just playing around, I mean, I wasn't doing anything clever at all there. I mean, I'm literally just, you know, I'm literally just coming down the scale, just coming up the scale. Just noodling around on it because it's so easy to play. Um, so just, just with certain rhythms, you know, just a phrase, a few little, you know, little bounces in there. You know, when you do that, like the typical John into his old Geddy Lee kind of thing. Little two little sixteenth uh, notes in there. You know, it just gives you a little bit more rhythmic interest, I suppose. Um, and just you start on a, a certain note, so maybe start on the D on the seventh, you know, just work up to uh, three notes and then come back and land on the E maybe. Pick a starting note, pick an end note. And remember that if you land on the chord tones, they're going to be the, the sort of um, uh, the main points of resolution. So... When you land on the fourth, it wants to resolve. Third, you can land on that. <coughs> so play around on it and then start with one position, like that one, starting on the first finger. Maybe add that G up at the top, maybe. Just, just that one. Just. You can add that one into the mix. And then you know, start moving between these two positions. And just find your own little paths for moving from one note down to another. Like I said, you can start at maybe this E, just come down, shift down through those positions that I showed you. Shift down to the G and then the open E just to... So it's just a, a, a more basic way of, of approaching uh, positions for minor pentatonics because, like I said, people will show you those five, and I've done it on my channel as well, you know, showing you, you know, the, the, those positions of the pentatonic. And, the, and like I said, the problem with that is that you're not thinking 
from a particular root note or, or, or anything. You're not thinking the third, the fifth, you're just thinking of the box pattern. And thinking, okay, great, I can just... I can just noodle around in there, but, with it, but it becomes very mindless. Whereas when you're always knowing where you are with the E, it means that no matter where you are, you can spot an E. You know, slipping off again. You know, now I'm on this E. Now I'm on this E. Now fourth finger for that one. And you can just move around on them. And then, you know, you can add this one into the mix. To and then up to here. And like I said, it's very, very... Bland's not the word, but it's, um, you know, it's a very common sound. And it can become very, very, uh, a bit dull and a bit boring if you're not careful, because everybody's heard this sound so many times. But that said, if you're in a band and you want to put a fill in, and it's on a, an E, and you're like... You know, you can put in a little fill like that. You, you know that that's going to work there with that minor pentatonic. And put in context, uh, you know, drums are playing, ba uh, guitars playing, That you know, you've got all that going on. Stuff like that, it doesn't sound cheesy anymore because there's all that other stuff going on. You, you know, and there's, I mean, let's face it, rock music was basically born of that scale you know and there's yeah, so many songs that use that um now the other thing that you can do with this um i mean i could go on forever about this but this i mean you can do a lot of different things you know to try and mix it up a little bit you know limit yourself to sticking on two strings and moving up and down and all that kind of thing but in terms of adding some notes into the mix remember what i said about the blue scale <laughs> All that is, is a minor pentatonic with that chromatic passing note between the fourth and the fifth. So, now you can play up through that minor pentatonic, and look, you can just add that blues note in there. Now all of a sudden it has a little bit more of a bluesier sound, especially when you use that as a melodic device. So if you're, let's say, the fourth and then the blues note and back, you know, that kind of move. Now, that's one blues note that you can use. You can also put another one in between the flat seven and the octave. So if I'm can put a, a little chromatic passing note you can just use chromatic passing notes so a chromatic passing note between the d and the e which would be a d sharp so you work up and you just fill in the gaps with your fingers i mean you don't even have to think of notes and chromatic passing notes and stuff you just you just fill in the gaps see there it is it's below as well so, adding both note, uh, the blues note as well. So, so I came down through both of them then, just filled in the gaps between them, which is essentially what a chromatic passing note does. Okay, it's just a fancy name for filling in the gaps. And I mean, you can do that anywhere. I mean, So you can play it up there. So if you want to, let's say, move up between uh, from there. So from the third. Um, so there's the third up to the fourth as well. As long as it's in passing, you can do anything. You know, as long as you land on a, you know, on a on a consonant note. You... So I mean, what? <laughs> You <laughs> stick in anything and then just resolve it. So, so look, that's from the third to the uh, fifth of the of the scale. So that's fifth, sixth, and seventh frets. F uh, seventh, uh, eighth, ninth frets, and then 
in the uh, seventh, eighth fret, ninth, uh, uh, seven. <laughs> <laughs> tongue twisted 7th 8th and 9th frets on the D string as well so so you're just taking those little these little whole steps and just filling them in and all of a sudden you've got something a little bit more interesting I mean it's a full <laughs> it's, as long as you land on something Okay, so that's that's those, and you could even do it here. So you've got the G, and then just work down. So <laughs> the G, G flat, F, and then to the E. So tenth, ninth, eighth, and then seventh fret. So you can just fill in the gaps, and as long as you land on one of the, I, let's say, the notes of the pentatonic scale, or the, or, or specifically, or, or you know. I mean, if you land on the root note, you know it's going to be a good one. But, uh, I mean, as long as you land on one of the consonant notes, it doesn't really matter. The other thing that you can do is take group uh, different numbered groupings. So, instead of just playing like, like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, you can do things like, uh, like threes, like, or, you know, d d breaking them up between fours and twos and threes so i don't even know what it did then so that kind of thing uh fives uh, which you'll hear a lot in uh, jacko's playing and um you know so you'll come down one two three four five so uh, so you can you can break it up into fives the other thing that you can do is actually start uh, breaking it up into different intervallic uh sequences so t um i mean i won't go too far in this uh, but you know, let's say that you know all of this is by third. Let's say you can then maybe go up in fourths. So I could start on the D there, work up a fourth up to the G. So same fret, then do the same thing on the seventh fret. Um, you can't do it on the ninth fret. Uh, but so you've got these little fourths. So, so you can start breaking it up into fourths, into fifths. I mean, it's still the same scale, but it, it, it sounds completely different. You know, up here. Yeah, that's just using fifths. Now, the other thing that you can do as well, uh, I mean, that's just a, that, that takes it a little bit further, but it's just to break it up and just make it a little bit more interesting. But uh, the other thing you can do is add some extra scale notes in there. And usually the one that will work with this most of the time is going to be the Dorian scale. And all you've got to do to turn it into a Dorian is put your second back in there. And the sixth, the major sixth. So what we had before... We've now got that C sharp in there. And we've got the F sharp in there as well. So now, if I was to use it into, um, you know, just playing it, then it's going to be a Dorian scale. Uh, but what we're doing here is is minor pentatonic. So what we're going to be doing is just is just adding it in there for a little bit of flavour. So if I'm playing up. So I've got the, that major sixth in there. There it is, I'm coming down from that seventh, so. And you'll hear that all the time. You know, in slap stuff, you get that. That's the note. So it's all pentatonic based. You know, that's pentatonic. But then, all of a sudden, you can put that second in there as well. Not that, that was major. <laughs> but you can actually, on slapping, you can actually stick it in like Mark King does. 
but you're basically putting the nuts of the Dorian in there. And if you really want to add it, uh, if you want to do a little bit more, just as a little tip, you can start a minor pe uh, a minor arpeggio on the second degree of the scale. So on that E minor pentatonic, you could put a minor arpeggio or a minor seventh arpeggio there on the uh, starting on the F sharp. So so. Okay, so, so instead of it just being, you've got this. So now we're adding chromatics in there, and the. Again, I'm, I'm coming down that minor arpeggio, F sharp minor, and then maybe. Just adding in those chromatic notes. So all it is, is it's just, you start with the basic minor pentatonic scale, you know, that I started with. I mean, we started looking at, <laughs> you know, just that exact same pattern in one octave and then just expanded to know all of the notes in that area. Added a few more notes in, expanded that map. Took it down to here. Started joining them up. And then just started adding in all these little chromatic notes and, uh, and whatnot. And like I say, as soon as you start putting it into slapping, it, it, it suddenly starts, I mean, it, I mean, that's slapping, in it? It's all, it's all minor pentatonic, and you get that that uh, major sixth in there as well. Um, you get the second in there. Uh, what's an example of that? I mean, there. So I'm using that major sixth again, Dorian. But at the heart of it, it's just minor pentatonic. You know. That's that minor pentatonic sound, but then adding this, that's adding that Dorian thing. Um, you know, it's all, that's all Dorian. Minor pentatonic with a few, you know, a little bit of spice from the Dorian. So you kind of just bring it in into the mix, kneading it in. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's just a few, uh, like I said, it's just a bit of fun, this one. I'm, I'm not really... Um, you know, it's not all um, academic and all that kind of thing. It's just having a look at a few patterns for a minor pentatonic. Because, like I said, in rock and pop music, you get minor pentatonics a lot. And it's a lot of the time it's going to be on E, which is why I did it in E. And just knowing, you know, just a few little... Just that. Just knowing how to traverse those, those patterns. And then... And then, you know, just be able to move between between those uh, positions. That's what makes it a lot uh, a lot easier. And like I said, you can start filling in the gaps with chromatics. You know, chromatic approach notes. There, I just approach the E from the uh, half step below, just a fret below, just bring it in. So. And Bob's your uncle. So, um, yeah, so that's just a little uh, something to to mess around with. I do talk about this in the Scale Essentials course. Um, but really, um, it's you're probably best off uh, looking at something like the... Um, uh, in terms of the course, it's probably more the chord tone essentials, actually, because that gets to the crux of the biscuit, really, in terms of the chord tones. I might do a pentatonic course, actually. You know, fill in a... Uh, you know, just build up a little bit like that. I've not thought about that before. Because I've done Scale Essentials, but I don't really... In Scale Essentials, I don't really go in deep on pentatonics. Um, uh, I'll need to practice a bit because I just... <laughs> like, I need to um, get myself back into uh, into shape with it. Um, because, you know, the more you practice this, the more that you have, the more that uh, creative that you are with it. At the moment, I'm just noodling around. Um, but if you practice for a little bit um, with it, you start to have all these cool little ideas 
uh, of which they're not they're not uh, as readily available because I just haven't been practicing enough. But um, yeah, so I might do a course on that. Um, okay, so that's it for the uh, minor pentatonic. So uh, let's see uh, how disinterested people or interested people are. <laughs> Did that help, by the way, with anything? Did I, did I uh, shed some light on anything? Because I'm pretty sure that most of you uh, that have delved into pentatonics have probably started thinking, and then, you know, and worked through them that way. Um, you know, and you've probably had someone describe those as modes or something like that, the modes of the minor pentatonic, but it's, uh, but they're not really. That's not, uh, it's not really the way to look at it. Um, can you do an in-depth tutorial on passing notes, please? Um, you don't really need an in-depth tutorial on them. I mean, I talk about those in depth or on um, in the Chord Tone Essentials course. So if you, if I, I would advise looking at the Chord Tone Essentials course, but a passing note, I mean, just on the basis, uh, oh, sorry, the basics of it is just a, a, a passing a note passing between two chord tones. So if you're, I, I talked about this. Which, um, in the improvisation live hang that I did, check out the live hang that I did uh, uh, last week. Uh, I talked about improvisation and we were looking at... Let's put on a bit of, a bit of reverb for that one. <laughs> so, if I'm on an E flat there, so, um, you know, the E flat. Uh, let's do it C so that we know what we're doing. So, there's C. So we're on a C major, we're in a C major chord, let's say. And so you want to use a, a passing note, well, so E, F, G, the F is a passing note. So E and G are the chord tones. There's the arpeggio, C, E, G. E, F, G, passing note. C, D, E, passing note. E, D, C, passing note. So... And then if you went from the uh, fifth up to the seventh. It's just moving between them. So... Uh, There you go again, so C, D, E. So yeah, passing notes, just um, noodling. Um, uh, new, so Francisco, uh, new to this stuff, so what you just show, what's the difference with mode? I guess you mean modes. It changes the overall sound. Um, or the melody is more open with modes and with this method you stay with the overall, same overall feel, feeling. Uh, no, I mean, it's just... It is what it is. It's a minor pentatonic. You use it when you want to have a minor pentatonic sound. I mean, don't get too caught... Honestly, people get too caught up in modes. And um, you don't want to get too caught up in modes. It's like... There's a lot to cover before you get into modes. Minor pentatonics are cool because you can just bang them out over an E, over an e minor. The only thing that you need to learn as a bass player or a musician when you're getting started with any of this stuff is chord tones. Learn the harmony. Learn what the learn what you're playing over. Forget scales, forget modes and all that. Even this minor pentatonic. Learn the chord tones. Learn what the notes the notes are in the chords. Learn what they sound like. Watch my improvisation lesson I did last week. It's it's that. And then all the other stuff works around that framework. You know, it's just filling in the gaps then between the chord tones. But modes Modes are generally used for modal jazz, modal pieces, modal compositions, contemporary classical pieces, stuff like that. Modes, like, I mean, it, there is an element of it, like I said, with Dorian, you know. 
you you get it in that stuff um but it, it, it that's all influenced and dictated by the harmony so you know that whatever the harmony is so the all that other stuff like the modality of it the second the fourth and the sixth let's say um are going to are going to work around the first the third and the fifth or the first the third the fifth and the seventh uh, and they don't come from scales they come from they're just c chords chords exist as and of themselves um chords aren't created from scales you know I've, I've, I've so many times i've reiterated that yes they can be built from scales so you know they're c major you know and you just work through them Yeah, you can build chords from a scale, but chords exist as and of themselves. A major seven chord is a major seven chord. The creation of it, that you know, that root note, that major third, that perfect fifth, and that major seventh. That is a major seventh chord. It's built from tertian harmony. It's built from a set of thirds. There's basic principles behind all chord construction. You can have, uh, for instance, th here's proof that chords aren't built from scales. A chord... A major seven chord can be found twice in a major scale. So which one is it? Which which? So in a major key in C major, you get an there's a C major seven there on the root, but you've also got one on the fourth. So which one is it? Which one is creating the major seven? There's a, a three minor sevenths in there. So on a on a you know in a in a C major uh, scale, you've got D minor, you've got E minor, and you've got A minor. Which one is it? So is A is the E minor uh, is the minor seven chord created from a major scale, a third below? No, it's not. It's just a, it's just a chord. You know, there's a basic construction of a chord, and then you find them in uh, in scales. But that's just something that I just oh, it's um, not that anybody's asked about this. I'm just digressing, but. It's one of those things that really gets my goat because uh, you see so many people think getting too caught up into real rigid things about, um, you know, like about how scales and chords relate to each other. And it's, oh, man, it's look at harmony, learn harmony, learn chord construction, learn what intervals are. And then all that modal stuff and all that kind of thing that comes later you might get hints of it in certain songs that you're playing but let the let your repertoire deal with that learn stuff and it, and if it's applicable to a song that you're learning then it's applicable but don't learn the theory first you know so if you're learning some a, a slap line that goes oh jesus let's get rid of that that <laughs> and you got that major six in it and someone says that's from a dorian scale it's like whoa okay you think, okay, well, I can use that Dorian scale for that. And it comes from that rather than thinking, okay, I've got to learn all my modes and I've got to then learn and then learn what the application is. Because <laughs> if you go down the road of that, um, you're going to, there's too much. There's too much stuff to really talk about in terms of application because then you start getting, what do you do? Start learning about orchestral music? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much application. Uh, I, I mean, if anybody out there really does want to learn a little bit more about what modes are and what the actual usage can be like, uh, I'd, if you want a book on it, I would uh, probably recommend Vincent Persichetti's um, 20th Century Harmony. Uh, it's one of the main textbooks that everybody has at university. And it's uh, it's really good. You learn about all these harmonic projections and things like that. It's, it's, it's compositional. It's not, it's not about playing. But you learn all of this theory stuff about com compositional devices. Uh, and modes are, are talked about. There's a really good chapter on modes. Um, so, yeah, if anybody is into learning a bit more about theory and stuff, then uh, Vincent Percy Chetty or Ketty or whatever it is, uh, 20th Century Harmony. I, I love that. In fact, I think I've got it here. There you go. It's a beaut. I, I love that book. Where's the modes bit? Let's have a look. Oh, good. I've got the cover on back to front. Uh, 20th Century Harmony. Creative... Uh, what is it? Creative Aspects and Practice. Yeah, there's a whole load. Yeah, Chapter 2, Scale Materials, Modes, Synthetic Scale Formations, Pentatonic and Exotonic Scales. But it's all about how you apply them in composition. 
Because really, a lot of this theory stuff, you know when people say they want to learn music theory, mm, what, you really, what most bass players want to learn is actually the basics of functional harmony. Theory can go way out. I mean, you know, I've had to learn a lot of theory. I've got a degree in music, and you can imagine when you do a degree, it's, um, you get pretty deep into theory. And most of it is basically based around arranging and composition and and the sort of nuts and bolts of stuff like 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 let's say you're studying counterpoint or something like that you'll look at um you know that the history of certain things uh the, the history um, i say the th history of theory but it's the history of um of composition really that's basically what you're looking at uh so you look at counterpoint you look at um you know fugal writing and things like that and then eventually you get into like the, the further you go you can look at like you know like bartokian axis theory and um uh what is it blooming you know shankirian analysis and and then you get into serialism and atonality and and using 12 tone rows and then and then you go beyond you know um you know stockhausen and all that and you know that is not what bass players generally are talking about when they're thinking about theory what they're generally talking is about is the basics about you scales and harm and uh, chord tones and that just comes into the uh, what you're looking at with that is the absolute basics of functional harmony which is like elementary level stuff right it's the stuff you learn as a you know before you get onto like courses in stuff you know like academically it's like the real basics like what are the what are intervals you know what <laughs> what's a perfect fifth you know real basic stuff like that and then looking at how scales are created like a major scale a minor scale you look at key signatures circle of fifths blah de blah de blah um and you know chord construction how triads are created seven chords and then how chords interact what a tonic is dominant subdominant how they, you know, cadences, authentic cadences, plagal cadences, interrupted cadences, all that kind of stuff. It's real basic stuff that you can find in any kind of theory textbook. Um, but I have to mention all that because I think what happens is that all too often a lot of bass players um, are, are taken down a path of thinking that they have to learn theory. But like I say, theory is a very wide-ranging thing. Um, and it, most of it, 90% of it, 95% of it has absolutely nothing to do with anything that you will do on that bass guitar, especially if you're playing in rock bands, pop bands, metal bands, stuff like that. If you aren't going to be doing orchestral arranging, big band arranging, uh, you know, orchestral composition, all this kind of stuff, then most of it is kind of, you know, unnecessary, shall we say. Um, but interesting, you know. But the majority of stuff that I did at college, I'm never going to use. Most of it, I can't remember. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's why I say don't don't do a good to because the problem is if you if you thought, oh, I need to learn theory. Somebody told me I need to learn theory, and you went down and got Walter Piston's um, um, th uh, what is it, Harmony book or uh, or Counterpoint or Harmony by Schoenberg or something like that. It's going to be well outside your wheelhouse. It, it's completely unapplicable so uh yeah anyway that's a bit of a rant don't even know what i'm ranting about <laughs> total straw man so let's have a look i generally go on a rant don't i like massive digression in these things um uh Another scale, but is how you apply it. A minor pentatonic over C major seven. Define your style and sound. Is there freedom a bit? How far can you go out? Well, I mean, it is just a set of notes, and I mean, on a basic, uh, basic, uh, um, you know, perspective, you use a minor pentatonic over a minor chord or a minor seven. Um, so if you've got E minor seven. Uh, but that's that's why it's, it's used so much in rock because a lot of it's a lot of it's you know power chords you know it's it's all outlining root movement rather than you know you know it's it's not functional in that sense so you can get away you can get away with just playing minor pentatonics over everything. Um, you can move them around um, to different chord root notes um, 
and you can use let's say um let, uh, if, if you think of a c major uh scale and think of what minors you've got in there you've got d minor e minor and this is in the c major key you've got d minor e minor and a minor well that means you could pretty much use those three minor pentatonics over the top uh, each one will give you a different set of um uh what's the word um we're going to say tonalities but uh yeah you know you've got c major but this is hard without actually having a, a track uh to to hear it or a piano but over a c major so over a c major chord if you were to use a minor pentatonic for instance well what you got well you got the sixth so that gives it a certain uh sound then you got the c okay e um that's actually you know going to be the third so you got the two chord tones in there of c major you got the g as well you put you got the d so you got the ninth in there as well so from that angle you've got the chord tones of that c major chord let's say a c major chord a c major triad that is and but you've got the added sixth and the second which gives you a different kind of sound so you know you could use it over that so so if you're over a c major and then you put in you know you use the a minor pentatonic over it you, you can sort of get away with that probably less um likely to use it on well i mean if you used it on the um the e minor so so the e on the on the in over a c major chord what you're gonna have then you're gonna have the third of the chord you're gonna have the fifth of the chord so these are all chord tones you're gonna have the sixth again you're gonna have the seventh and you're gonna have the ninth so each it's uh, I, I mean you wouldn't want to just say okay i'm gonna play that minor pentatonic scale if you had a bunch of licks that you use over a particular minor pentatonic, like minor pentatonic licks, it means that you could recycle them over, let's say, let's say a C major chord on that E, and it would give a different sound. So let's say using those E minor pentatonic, uh, like E minor pentatonic, let's say. E minor pentatonic used over C major, a particular lick, is going to sound different to what it is over the E minor chord. Uh, so, you know, it's just what, it's just the fact that it's got common notes in there. Let's face it, if that minor pentatonic had no notes in rel you know, relative to that C major, then you'd probably be less likely to use it. It's only because it's got common tones. You want to look for common notes in the things that you're going to be using. That's where substitutions, why they work, you know. That's why a tritone substitution works, because of the common tones. Um... What is a good beginner amp you would recommend? The one I always recommend is just the Fender Rumble. Um, I've seen some people on here criticise them, but I mean, I've been using one. Um, I've been using one for the last two years, or three years, I think, uh, just as my monitor in the um, in the other room, you know, for recording the vids, and it's great. Really light. I love really light gear. Um, you know, my GR bass is ridiculously light. That's behind me there. But, um, yeah, Fender Rumbles, I can't complain about them. They're, I think they're great. I would always recommend those as just a beginning. For a practice amp, absolutely brilliant. Can you use a, a, a basic a beginner, you know, 50-watt amp or 100-watt practice amp for playing in a band? Probably not. It's not, probably not going to have enough oomph. Um, if you want a practice amp, I always advocate for actually having a diff, uh, two separate amps. A cheap practice amp. Uh, not too cheap uh, because then they just sound awful but uh, if you're going to be gigging go all in get yourself an amp that you can use for gigging don't try and use a practice amp if you're going to have one just have one that you would use for both but i don't like that that's what i used to do for years and i know it's expensive to buy two amps but um the problem you get with a, a if you get a very powerful amp for doing gigs and then you have it as a practice amp you're always on barely beyond zero with the volume it's terrible so it's always good to have a practice amp that you can actually turn up to like you know a quarter or halfway um without it just destroying your house <laughs> you know deafening everybody um the 
chord tone course really made thinking about pentatonics much easier instead of a pattern thinking about the third fourth fifth and seventh easier to move that to any root yep that's that's why i say learn chord tones learn harmony and everything else makes more sense i i, I talked about I, I, somebody was asking about this on uh, the bass buzz forum you know uh, josh's uh, site uh, and they were asking about that about about uh, i think they were asking about arian cap's music theory book and uh I don't have Ariane Cap's theory. I, I need to get it actually, and uh, she's great. I love Ariane, uh, so I'm, I'm guessing the book's fantastic. Um, but uh, they were asking about theory, and so I outlined what the best um, path is to take in terms of you know learning theory. Um, and the first thing you need to learn is intervals. Learn intervals inside out. Learn everything you can about intervals, and then it will make everything else. It, it will create a foundation upon which everything else will seem really easy it'll it'll you'll understand everything if you go into learning chord construction or scales or anything anything beyond intervals um without knowing about intervals then you're gonna it's just gonna sound like a load of academic rubbish because they're going to be it's all going to be described in terms of intervals and intervallic construction and if you've got your intervals down and there's not that much to learn, but if you've got your intervals down, then it all makes sense. And then do chord construction, learn about chord construction. I don't mean learning chords on bass. I mean learning arpeggios. Learn about chord construction principles and then learn functional harmony, learn how chords interact. And then everything will just start to seem so much easier. And every time you listen to Rick Beato or Adam Neely, you'll understand it all. Um... And by the way, before I go any further, remember, I've not said it yet, it's the 10th anniversary sale, so uh, we're, uh, it finishes tomorrow. So this is the, the end of the 10th anniversary sale. So if you're going to get one of the courses at a discount price, then you want to do it uh, ASAP because it all shuts down tomorrow. Um, how do you move from knowing the notes that fit chords to using them effectively? I feel like my bass lines either sound too much like straight up as yours or jump around too much. The Chord Tone Essentials course gives you that exact knowledge. <laughs> it's funny you mention it. Uh, in module three of uh, Chord Tone Essentials, I go through how to create bass lines, melodies, solos, fills, all of it using the chord tones. And then, see, the, the key is to not just use chord tones. Learning about chord tones is not about just using chord tones. It's about using non-chord tones as well. You learn the chord tones and then you learn how to use the non-chord tones. Because basically, if you've got a C major scale, let's say it's a C major chord, right? you got, let's say, well, let's say it's just a, a C major triad. You've got the C, E, and the G. Well, where does the scale come into play? Well, it's because you look at it in terms of melodic devices, passing notes, approach notes, all of that stuff. A scale is simply a basic chord structure. It's basically a, an arpeggio. This isn't what a scale is. This isn't what scales were created from. But in essence, in application, a C major scale is a C major arpeggio or a C major seven arpeggio with a D there joining the C to the E, the F there joining the E to the G, and the A there joining the G to the B. You can use them as, uh, uh, as uh, passing notes. As I showed earlier, you can use them as, as neighbor notes. You know... I talked about this in the uh, chord tone. Uh, I think the, did I do it in chord tones last week or improvisation? Check out the improvisation one that I did last week. I, I really went deep, deep dove into that. But if you really want to learn that chord tone essentials course is the one uh, that you will. Um, I can't overstate how um, important I think that chord tone essentials th uh, course is. For the majority of you, if you if you're a member of all the talking bass community and you don't have the chord tone essentials course, then you should get the chord tone essentials course because everything I talk about in everything else is all in there. It's it gives you such a good foundation for everything. Uh, you'll learn how you know chord uh, symbols that you see on a chord chart like G seven flat nine and C major seven and D six and you know all that. You will learn what every single one of those is. You will learn the construction of every single one. That's just the first module. 
uh, and then you'll learn how to put those over the entire fretboard and then you learn how to apply them all and with non-chord tones. So I can't um, recommend the Chord Tone Essentials course enough for people that want to, you know, learn about that. Yep, Walter says the walking bass course helps in adding and mixing up all the pieces. Yeah, it does. Because then you're applying it, you know. Is music theory more useful in jazz? Not really. I mean, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, um, yeah, probably. Because playing a walking bass line, you're going to need to know harmony. You can't, you can't make a walking bass line if you don't know what the notes of the chords are. It's, in, it's impossible. You could guess. But, you know, but really you've got to know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing and it's just random, well, you're not very good, are you? I mean, it's just, that, or maybe, you. I mean, you could do it by ear, I guess, if you had perfect pitch. But, I mean, really, yeah, you, you do have to know that. But you, but it's no less important in any other style. Um, but like I say, it's not music theory. Forget about music theory. Chuck that out of the door. It's not music theory, it's harmony. It's functional harmony, and it's a, it's a thing that all bass players should have a good grounding in, because that's what we do. That's our job in the band, is to outline the harmony. And if you don't know anything about harmony, well, you're not doing your job right. I mean, you can play the notes that someone gives you, you know, if you learn a, a song. But, uh, you know, in terms of creating a bass line... Um, and not just a riff, because a, a riff's different. If you you know, if you're just playing, a, you know, just something like that. Or, I mean, it's still based on harmonic principles. But if you have to work through a chord progression, a la James Jameson or something like that, well, it, it's equally as important to know about harmony as it is in jazz. Uh, to do something like that because otherwise you're not going to know what the notes of the chord are. You won't be able to create a melodic bass line very well if you don't know what the notes of the chords are. Uh, what minimum watt amp for a practice amp? I would say 50 watts. Um, I've heard 25 watt ones, 10 watt ones, all that kind of stuff and they're always... I mean, they do, you can hear something but it's just not very bass. I, they start farting out. Um, I think... Um, uh, the Fender Rumble 40 is like the sweet spot. I've got one of those and it's great. It's it's the perfect volume for a practice amp. Not playing with a band though. That's different. If I'm going to be playing with a band, I want enough headroom that I can really crank it out. But for a practice amp, so I don't mean band practice amp. I mean practicing at home, you know, just noodling around. Uh, I'd go 45, I'd go for that Fender Rumble 40. That's that's the sweet spot for that. You don't need any more than that. Um, and any less than that, and it just sounds a bit naff. Um, but then if you're going to be playing in a band, I would say I, I'd always want a minimum of 250 watts. Um, or 500 watts would be, a, you know, probably preferable. Are you watching the Crawford Spence fight tonight? Yes, I am. Well, I'll be recording it because I'm not going to stay up until three o'clock in the morning to watch that. Uh, yeah, I'll be watching that. I'll be watching the uh, UFC as well. It's me at the moment. I'm just all I'm about at the moment. I've got me um, <laughs> like my YouTube channel recommendations. It's like literally um, um, Dustin Poirier and Justin Gagey, um, Spence Crawford, and UAP Senate Committee. It's like, that's it. <laughs> it's like, just like boxing, MMA and UFOs. <laughs> Thanks, Groove Stranger. Congrats again on 10 years. Your lessons have been enormously beneficial. Thank you very much. Cool. Right. Any last questions? Because I'm going to get moving because I'm burning up. And I think our kids are still going to be awake. I need to get them off to bed. My missus is gigging at the moment, but I think she should be back soon. I've got the uh, in-laws babysitting at the moment while I'm doing it. Um, but any last... Uh... Ash says, uh, Scott Devine keeps sending me SBL discounts. Can you slap him for me, please? <laughs> yeah. 
somebody said that that me and Scott ought to do like a uh, you know like the YouTuber boxing you know like um, Jake Paul and all that. Me and him. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> His brother apparently is a really good martial artist, um, or was. I think he had an injury, um, and obviously I did for years. Oh, well, not that long, but um, my back's knackered now, and I've got zero. Like, I, I, pff, I used to be able to do the splits, you know, and and in the air, you know, like David Lee Roth. I used to be able to do that and uh, kick well above Ed Eye and that, you know, I'd, I'd really, really flexible. Um, and uh, not anymore. I can't even touch my toes properly. <laughs> <laughs> On my ass. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Yeah, I'm letting it go a little bit because obviously this is the end of the 10th anniversary and I want to, um, you know, milk it a little bit because it's, uh, it's quite an emotional um time for me really because like looking back over the 10 years because I, I started the um i started it up because obviously we had abigail uh, and she's 10 it's weird like every time i look at abigail i see talking bass because it's like i started it because she was born and um looking at as she gets older you know it's, it's weird it's like talking bass is my baby and so is abigail so like you know see her at 10 and it's like man i mean it's flown by um you know i mean I still feel like I'm like when I talk about um, like modern music and stuff, I'm, I'm talking about stuff that was at, you know, Rihanna and all that. And it's not anymore, is it? But it seems like this last 10 years has just like disappeared. Um, it's, it's weird. Simply because I've not been gigging like I used to be, you know, like through the 90s and the 2000s. It was like I was really busy and I was, you know, I was at college and then I started gigging and I was doing all that and and then 2013, I started this. And since then, I mean, it's just disappeared. Um, it's like one minute, I'm like, how old were I when I started it? 33. And now I'm... No, what were I? No. I'm talking about 38 when I when I started. Yes, yeah, the 38 when I started it. And now I'm going on 50, which is kind of weird. Uh, so for solos, would you only use this variation of pentatonics? Uh, oh, God, not for full jazz experience, no. Um, no, you need to know a lot more if you're going to solo through a jazz progression. Um, th th you know, this is the absolute basics of doing a rock solo, you know, like uh, doing a, a fill over a Black Sabbath tune. I mean, that's what we're looking at here. But you can use it for a lot more than that, obviously. If you listen to Michael Brecker playing, a, a, you, know, a, you know, using pentatonics, it's ridiculous, you know. There's a lot you can do with pentatonics. Um, a lot of gospel players use pentatonics um, a lot. The SBL hard sell is unappealing. I bailed on that place. Okay. <laughs> I have to be careful what I say, obviously, because me and Scott are pretty good buds. Um, but I know what you mean. Don't forget the English women at FIFA. My daughter wants to be a... Um, uh she wants to be a footballer so yeah she'll be she's probably she's probably uh she's probably got football on right now she's um yeah she's in the football team at school it's amazing how all the i never thought i'd see it the um you know uh like female football uh taking off like it has um not because you know they can't play football <laughs> it's just that it's um i didn't think it would because of the culture you know it's got a little bit of a macho kind of um angle to it but you know with all the all the um how it's really taken off you know the women's uh, football it's uh, especially in england i mean it's on all the time here now and yeah all the kids at school they're mad on it and she loves it um you know she loves ronaldo and messy. <laughs> it's good as well because I can give her tips. You know, like she, she likes defending, and uh, so I, I give her. I was giving her some tips the other day, just in the garden. I'd not really taken much interest to be honest. But then I started giving her some tips and defend uh, as a defender, and uh, and then she were able to put it into practice when she went back to school and she were playing. And I says, "Oh, did you, did you, uh, did you?" Cause she kept just running into the for the ball, you know. But now I'm getting her to track back and hold back. 
and um, and yeah, she's doing well. So uh, you never know; she might be a she might be a footballer yet. Or using your cortons class, you can open up the other notes. Yep, you'll learn about every single chord um, that that you've ever seen. Thanks, Mark. Also, U Usyk is the goat. Well, nah. He is brilliant, though. Um, and, you know, Tyson Fury should be fighting him rather than Francis Ngannou. I, I would... I love Tyson Fury, but I would laugh my knackers off if Francis knocked him out. That... Uh, the world would lose its mind. <laughs> can you imagine? Thing is, he can hit like a steam train. So, if he um, if he clocks him, he can knock him out. I don't think he will. I don't think he'll even manage to land a glove on him. But um, it would be funny if that happened. You know, be like a error, error <laughs> kind of moment. You ever hear Mike Stern play with Michael Brecker? Yep. Oh, yeah. This uh incredible. Yeah, so women's football's gone big in the States as well, yeah. Hi, Mark. If there is a song that uses a simple chord progression, G, D, E minor, and C on a 4-4, how would you apply minor pentatonic scales for fills or riffs? Well, if it's in G major, you're more likely... So let's say it's in G major, and the chord progression you just said was G major, D major, E minor, and C. <laughs> that old chestnut. <laughs> um, uh, you... If you wanted to use pentatonics, well, you'd use major pentatonic for the for the G. You could use D D major pentatonic. Then for the E minor E minor pentatonic, and then C C major pentatonic. But it gets a little bit convoluted if you just start thinking of pentatonics for everything. Um, that's why you're better off actually looking at it in terms of uh, chord tones because doing that you'd be able to look at G major and instead and then for the D major E minor and then the C major well that's the C major pentatonic but so that you get a framework of notes that's your framework to work around and then the other stuff you can just add in there um so yeah i mean you can use pentatonics but you're better off thinking chord tones to be honest especially for a yeah for that kind of thing if it was a uh, when it's more of a rock tune where you're in a proper e minor you know that's when that kind of uh, stuff comes into play how do you rate john entwistle yeah i love him have you seen my um, breakdown of uh, my generation? That's uh, that's one to look at. But yeah, John's brilliant. Or was. Right, I will get moving. It's uh, time to go. So it's been great doing this. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your support uh, over the last 10 years. It's been nuts. I don't know if any of you have been with me for the last 10 years. Um, but um, yeah, it's. I, I honestly could not have carried on uh, if it wasn't for the support of everybody. Um, there's been times when, like, especially early on, when I was just wondering whether I was going to be able to, to, to keep going, because you, you can't, you can't sustain a, a YouTube channel without having income. You can't, you can't, it, it doesn't work because the, the, you just can't, you can't run the website, you can't run anything because the more traffic you get, the more it's going to cost you. So, you know, and I just wouldn't have had the time to do it if I was out gigging, if I was doing stuff. So I needed to be able to generate at, at least enough revenue to, to sustain it. And at first it was my wife that was, she was gigging. She was doing loads and loads of gigs to try and sustain us. I was trying to, I was working 24 seven, trying to get the thing work, up and running, the website, the channel, everything. And 
you know, it's a very solitary lifestyle that I live with this. Um, I'm in here every day, not in this thing, but like I've got another computer in there now, thank God, so that I'd have to sit in this tent. But like, um, you know, it's a very solitary kind of lifestyle that I lead uh, doing this, and I'm working all the time on it. And, you know, the, the actual comments that people have and, and the testimonials and when people tell me about how it's changed their plane or and it, they've got light bulb moments and all this kind of stuff, it, I read every single comment and I read every single email and all of that. And it makes a massive difference because it, it motivates me. Because if I wasn't hearing anything, let's say it was the polar opposite and I wasn't hearing anything from anybody, um, I'd be like, why the hell am I doing it? It just seemed pointless, you know. Um, so, you know, it's good to, uh, now be able to, 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 to say that the actual company is actually, you know, sustaining itself and I'm actually able to earn a living from it. Um, but I, I wouldn't have got to that stage and I wouldn't do it if I wasn't actually appreciated, let's say there'd be no point. It'd be like, what, what would the point be? Just something else, you know? Uh, so it's, um, it does make a massive difference to me. Uh, so yeah, thanks to everybody for all of that. And, uh, like I said, it's quite an emotional, um, month, uh, you know, 10 years and, and that I never thought I'd carry it on for this long. And, uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll still be around in another 10 years as well. So, all right then everybody, uh, loved, uh, doing this and I'll be around again, probably next Saturday. Watch your inboxes for it. Remember that the sale finishes tomorrow. So, uh, I'll put an email out to tell everybody. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. All right then. Thanks everybody. I will see you later.